Hi class, I'm going to read for you guys a little bit of the first chapter of the book just so that you have a, a chance to get some of this content before you guys have received it. If you've ordered it online, you're able to get the ebook or the text uh, hard copy like I have, but I'm just going to read some of it for you here. So I hope you enjoy this. I'll start um, with Psychological Science is Born, and this is Learning Outcome uh, P4. So what were some of the milestones in psychology's early history? To be human is to be curious about ourselves and the world around us. Before 300 BC, the Greek naturalist and philosopher Aristotle theorized about learning and memory, motivation and emotion, perception and personality. Today we chuckle as some of his guesses, like the suggestion that a meal makes us sleepy by causing gas and heat to collect around what he believed to be was the source of our personality, the heart, but credit Aristotle with asking the right questions. Psychology's first laboratory. Philosophers thinking about Thinking continued until the birth of psychology as we know it. That happened on December day in 1879 in a small third, story, third floor room at German University of Leipzig. There, two young men were helping an austere middle-aged professor, Wilhelm Wundt, create an experimental apparatus. Their machine measured how long it took for people to press a telegraph key by hearing a ball pin hit a platform. Curiously, People responded in about a tenth of a second when asked to press the key as soon as the sound occurred, and in about two tenths of a second when asked to press the key as soon as they were consciously aware of perceiving the sound. To be aware of one's own awareness takes a little longer. Wundt was seeking to measure the atoms of the mind, the fastest and simplest mental processes. So began the first psychological laboratory staffed by Wundt and psychology's first graduate students. Psychology's first thoughts. First, school of thoughts. Before long, the new science of psychology became organized into different branches of schools of thought, each promoted by pioneering thinkers. Two early schools were structuralism and functionalism. Structuralism. Much as chemists developed the periodic table to classify chemicals elements, so psychologists Edward Bradford and Titchener aimed to classify and to understand elements of the mind structure he engaged people in self-reflective introspection, looking inward, training them to report the elements of their experience as they looked at the ro rose, listened to a metronome, smelled a scent, or tasted a substance. What were their immediate sensations? Their images, their feelings? How did these relate to one another? Alas, structuralism's technique of introspection proved somewhat unreliable. It required smart, verbal people, and its results varied from person to person and experiences to experiences. As introspection waned, so did structuralism. Hoping to assemble the mind's structure from simple elements was rather like trying to understand a car by examining, examining its disconnected parts. Functionalism. Philosopher psychologist William James sought to go beyond labeling our inward thoughts and feelings by considering their evolved functions. Smelling is what the nose does. Thinking is what the brain does. But why does the nose and brain do these things? Under the influence of evolutionary theorist Charles Darwin, James assumed that thinking, like smelling, developed because it was adaptive. It helped our ancestors survive and reproduce. Consciousness served a function. It enabled us to consider our past, adjust to our present, and plan our future. To explore the mind's adaptive functions, James studied down-to-earth emotions, memories, willpower, habits, and the moment-to-moment -moment stream of consciousness. James's writings moved the publisher, Henry Holt, to offer James a contract for a textbook on the new science of psychology. James agreed and began working in 1878. With an apology for requesting two years to finish his writing, the text proved an unexpected chore and actually took him 12 years. Why are we not surprised? More than a century later, people still read the results, Principles of Psychology, 1890, and marvel at the brilliance and elegance with which James introduced psychology to the educated public. Psychology's First Women. James's legacy stems from his Harvard mentoring as well as his writing. In, 19, in 1890, 30 years before American women had the right to vote, he admitted Mary Whitcomb Calkins into his graduate seminar over the objections of Harvard's president. When Calkins joined, the other students, all men, dropped out, so James tutored her alone. Later, she finished all of Harvard's PhD requirements, outscoring all the male students on the qualifying exams. Alas, Harvard denied her her degree she had earned offering her instead a doctorate from Radcliffe College, its undergraduate sister school for women. 
Calkins resisted the unequal treatment and refused the degree. She nevertheless went on to become a distinguished memory researcher and in 1905, the first female president of the American Psychological Association. The honor of being the first female psychology PhD later fell to Margaret Floyd Washburn, who also wrote an influential book, The Animal Mind, and became the second female APA president in 1921. But Washburn's gender barred doors for her too. Although her thesis was the first foreign study Wundt published in his psychology journal, she could not join the all-male organization of experimental psychologists founded by Titchener, her own graduate advisor. What a difference from the recent past between 1997 and 2019, more than half of the elected presidents of the Science-Focused Association for Psychological Science were women. In the United States, Canada, Europe, women now earn most psychology doctorates. Psychological Science Matures In psychology's early days, many psychologists shared with the English essayist C.S. Lewis the view that there is only one thing, and the only one in the whole universe which we know more about than we could learn from external observation. That one thing, Lewis said, is ourselves. We have, so to speak, inside information. Wundt and Titchener focused on inner sensations, images, and feelings. James also engaged in introspection, introspective examination of the stream of consciousness and emotion, hoping to understand how they helped humans survive and thrive. For these and other early pioneers, psychology was defined as the science of mental life. Behaviorism. That definition endured until the 1920s when the first two proactive American psychologists challenged it. John B. Watson and later B. F. Skinner dismissed introspection and redefined psychology as the scientific study of observable behavior. After all, they said, science is rooted in observation. What you cannot observe and measure, you cannot scientifically study. You cannot observe a sensation, a feeling, or a thought, but you can observe and record people's behaviors as they are conditioned, as they have responded to and learn in different situations. Many agreed, and behaviorism was one of two major forces in psychology well into the 1960s. Freudian psychoanalytic psycho psychology. The other major force was Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic psychology, which emphasized the way our unconscious mind and childhood experiences affected our behavior. In chapters to come, we will look more closely at Freud's techniques, including his theories of personality and his views on unconscious sexual conflict and the mind's defense against its own wishes and impulses. Humanistic psychology. As behaviorists had rejected the early 20th century's definition of psychology, other groups rejected the behaviorist definition. In the 1960s, humanistic psychologists led by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow found both behaviorism and Freudian psychology too limiting. Rather than focusing on conditioned responses or childhood memories, the humanistic psychologists focused on growth potential, our need for love and acceptance, and the environments that nurture or limit personal growth. Contemporary Psychology Simultaneous with humanistic psychology's emergence, psychologists in the 1960s pioneered a cognitive revolution. This led the field back to its early interest in how our mind processes and retains information. Cognitive psychology today continues its scientific exploration of how we perceive, process, and remember information, and of how thinking and emotions interact in anxiety, depression, and other disorders. The marriage of cognitive psychology, the science of the mind, and neuroscience, the science of the brain, gave birth to cognitive neuroscience. This specialty with researchers in many disciplines studies the brain's activity underlying mental activity. Today's psychology built, builds on the work of many earlier scientists and schools of thought to encompass psychology's concerns with observable behavior and the, with the inner thoughts and feelings. We now define psychology as the science of behavior and mental processes. Let's unpack this definition. Behavior is anything an organism does. Any action we can observe and record, yelling, smiling, blinking, sweating, talking, tweeting, and questionnaire marking are all observable behaviors. Mental processes are our internal subjective experiences, our sensations, perceptions, dreams, thoughts, beliefs, and feelings. The key word in today's definition of psychology is science. Psychology is less a set of findings than a way of asking and answering questions. Our aim, then, is not merely to report results, but also to show you how psychologists play their game. You will see how researchers evaluate conflicting opinions and ideas. 
and you will learn how all of us, whether scientists or simply curious people, can think harder and smarter when experiencing and explaining the events of our lives. Psychology, the science of behavior and mental processes, has roots in many disciplines and countries. The young science of psychology developed from the more established fields of philosophy and biology. Wundt was both a philosopher and a physiologist. James was an American philosopher. Freud was an Austrian physician. Ivan Pavlov, who pioneered the, studying, the study of learning, was a Russian physiologist. Jean Piaget, the last century's most influential observa observer of children, was a Swiss biologist. These Magellans of the mind, as psychology historian Morton Hunt called them, illustrates the diversity of psychology's origins. Like those pioneers, today, estimated one million plus psychologists are citizens of many lands. The International Union of Psychologi Psychological Science has 82 member nations, from Albania to Zimbabwe. In China, the first university psychology department was established in 1978. By 2016, there were 270. Psychology is both a growing and globalizing. The story of psychology is being written in many places, with interests ranging from the study of nerve cell activity to the study of international conflict. Contemporary psychology, shaped by many forces, is particularly influenced by our understanding of biology and experience, culture and gender, and human flourishing. Evolutionary psychology and behavioral genetics. Are our human traits inherited, or do they develop through experience? This has been psychology's biggest and most persistent issue. But the, the debate over the nature-nurture issue is ancient. The Greek philosopher Plato assumed that we inherited characteristics, inherited character and intelligence, and that certain ideas are inborn. Aristotle countered that there is nothing in the mind that does not first come in from the external world through our senses. In the 1600s, European philosophers rekindled the debate. John Locke argued the mind is a blank slate on which experience writes. Rene Descartes disagreed, believing that some ideas are innate. Descartes' views gained support from curious naturalists two centuries later. In 1831, an indifferent student but ardent collector of beetles, mollusks, and shells set sail on a historic round-the-world journey. The 22-year-old voyager, Charles Darwin, pondered the incredible species variation he encountered, including tortoises on the one island that differed from those on nearby islands. Darwin's On the Origin of Species... 1859, explained this diversity by proposing the evolutionary process of natural selection. From among chance variations, nature selects traits that best enable an, orga an organism to survive and reproduce in a particular environment. Darwin's principle of natural selection, what philosopher Daniel Dennett has called the single best idea anyone ever had, is still with us 160 plus years later as biology's organizing principle. Evolution has become an important principle for 21st century psychology. This would surely have pleased Darwin, who believed his theory explained not only animal structures, but also animal behaviors, such as emotional expressions associated with human lust and rage. The nature-nurture issue recurs throughout this text as today's psychologists explore the relative contributions of biology and experience. They ask, for example, how are humans alike because of our common biology and evolutionary history? That's the focus of evolutionary psychology. And how do we individually differ? Because of our differing genes and environment. That's the focus of behavioral genetics. We can, for example, ask, are gender differences biologically predisposed or socially constructed? Is child children's grammar mostly innate or formed by experience? How intelligent, how intelligence and personality differences influenced by heredity and by environment? Are sexual behaviors more pushed by inner biology or pulled by external incentives? Should we treat psych psychological disorders, depression, for example, as a disorder of the brain, disorder of thought, or both? Such debate continues. Yet over and over again, we will see that in contemporary science, the nature-nurture tension dissolves. Nurture works on what nature provides. In chapter four, you will also learn about epigenetics, how experience can influence gene expression. And in chapter two, you will see that our species has been graced with the great biological gift of brain plasticity, an enormous capacity to learn and adapt. Moreover, every psychological event, every thought, every emotion is simultaneously a biological event. Thus, depression can be both a brain disorder and a thought disorder. Cross-culture, 
Cross-cultural and gender psychology. What can we learn about people in general from psychological studies done in one time and place? Often with participants from what psychologists have called the weird cultures, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. As we see time and again, culture, shared ideas and behaviors that one generation passes on to the next, matters. Our culture shapes our standards of promptness, frankness, our, our attitude towards premarital sex and varying body shapes, our tendency to be casual or formal, our willingness to make eye contact, our conversational distance, and much, much more. Being aware of such differences, we can restrain our assumptions that others will think and act as we do. It is also true, however, that our shared biological heritage unites us as a universal human family. Some aspects of our humanity, how we see and hear, how our bodies respond to stress, how our smiles communicate feelings, we share with all humans. And the same underlying process guides people everywhere. Some examples are people diagnosed with specific learning disorders, formerly called dyslexia, exhibit the same brain malfunction when they are Italian, French, or British. Variations in language may impede communication across cultures, and yet languages share deep principles of grammar. People in different cultures vary in feelings of loneliness, but across cultures, loneliness is magnified by shyness, low self-esteem, and being unmarried. We are each in certain respects like all others, and like some others, and like no other. Studies, studying people from all cultures helps us to discern our similarities and our differences, our human kinship and our diversity. You will see throughout this book that our gender identity, our sense of being male or female, or some combination of male and female also matters, as does our biologically influenced sex. Today's researchers report gender difference in what we dream, in how we express and detect emotions, and in our risk for alcohol use, depression, eating disorders. Gender differences fascinate us and studying them is potentially beneficial. For example, many researchers have observed that women carry on conversations more readily to build relationships while men talk more to give information and advice. Understanding these differences can help us to prevent conflict and misunderstanding in everyday interactions. But again, psychologically as well as biologically, humans are overwhelmingly similar. Regardless of gender, we learn to walk at about the same age. We experience the same sensation of light and sound. We remember vivid emotional events and we forget mundane details. We feel the same pangs of hunger, desire, and fear. We exhibit similar overall intelligence and well-being. The point to remember, even when specific attitudes and behaviors may vary by gender or across cultures as they often do, the underlying processes are much the same. Positive psychology. Psychology's first hundred years often focused on the understanding and treatment, treating troubles such as abuse, anxiety, depression and disease, prejudice and poverty. Much of today's psychology continues the exploration of such challenges. Without slighting the need to repair, damage and cure disease, Martin Seligman and others have called for more research on human flourishing, the understanding and developing of the emotions and traits that help us thrive. These psychologists called their approach positive psychology. They believe that happiness is a byproduct of pleasant, engaged, and meaningful life. Thus, positive psychology uses the scientific method to explore the building of a good life that engages our skills and a meaningful life that points us beyond ourselves. Psychology's three main levels of analysis. We all share a biologically rooted human nature, and yet many psychological and social cultural differences or influences fine tune our assumptions, values, and behaviors. We differ individually by gender identity, physical ability, sexual orientation, and each of us is a complex system that is a part of a larger social system, a family, ethnic group, culture, and socioeconomic status, combination of education, income, and occupation. The biopsychosocial approach integrates all three of these levels of analysis, the biological, psychological, and sociocultural. Consider horrific school shootings. Do they occur because the shooters have brain disorders or genetic tendencies that cause them to be violent? Because they observe brutality in the media or play violent video games? Because they live in gun-toting societies? The biopsychosocial approach enables psychologists to move beyond labels, school shooter, to consider the interconnected factors that lead to many violent acts. Clinical psychologists use this approach to help people with mental disorders. Each level of analysis offers a perspective for looking at behavior or mental process, yet each by itself is incomplete. Each perspective described in Table 1 asks different questions and has limits. 
but together they complete one another. Consider, for example, how they shed light on anger. Someone working from a neuroscience perspective might study brain circuits that cause us to be red in the face and hot under the collar. Someone working from an evolutionary perspective might analyze how anger facilitated survival of our ancestors' genes. Someone working from a behavioral genetics perspective might study how heredity and experience influence our individual differences in temperament. Someone working from a psychodynamic perspective might view an outburst as an outlet for unconscious hostility. And someone working from a behavioral perspective might attempt to determine what triggers aggressive acts. Someone working from a cognitive perspective might study how our interpretation of a situation affects our anger and how our anger affects our thinking. Someone working from a sociocultural perspective might explore how expression of anger varies across cultural contexts. The point to remember, like two-dimensional views of a three-dimensional object, each of psychology's perspectives is helpful, but each by itself, it by itself fails to reveal the whole picture. Psychology's subfields. Picturing a chemist at work, you may envision a laboratory scientist surrounded by test tubes and high-tech equipment. Picture a psychologist at work, and you would be right to envision a white-coated scientist probing a rat's brain, an intelligence researcher me measuring how quickly an infant shows boredom by looking away from the familiar picture, an executive evaluating a new healthy lifestyle training program for employees, a researcher at a computer analyzing big data from social media status updates or Google searches, a therapist actively listening to a depressed client's thoughts, a traveling academic visiting another culture and collecting data on variations in human values and behaviors, a teacher or a writer sharing the joy of psychology with others. The cluster of subfields we call psychology is a meeting ground for different disciplines. Thus, it's a perfect home for those with wide ranging interests. In diverse activities, from the biological experimentation to cultural competent comparisons, the tribe of psychology is united by a common quest describing and explaining behavior and the mind underlying it. Some psychologists conduct basic research that builds psychology's knowledge base. We will meet a wide variety of such researchers, including biological psychologists exploring the link between the body and the mind, developmental psychologists studying our changing abilities from womb to tomb, cognitive psychologists experimenting with how we perceive, think, and solve problems, personality psychologists investigating our persistent traits, and social psychologists exploring how we view and affect one another. These and other psychologists also may conduct applied research, tackling practical problems. Industrial organizational psychologists, for example, use psychology's concepts and methods in the workplace to help organizations and companies select and train employees, boost morale and productivity, design products, and implement systems. Psychology is a science, but it is also a profession that helps people have healthier relationships, overcome fear, feelings of anxiety and depression, and raise thriving children. Counseling psychology and clinical psychology grew out of his different historical traditions. Early counseling psychologists offered job skill guidance, whereas clinical psychologists worked alongside psychiatrists to assess and provide psychotherapy to people in the first psychology clinics. Today's counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists have a lot in common. Counseling psychologists help people cope with challenges and crises, including academic, vocational, and relationship issues, and assist those with psychological disorders to improve their personal and social functioning. Clinical psychologists focus on assessing and treating people with mental and emotional and behavioral disorders. Both counseling and clinical psychologists administer and interpret tests provide counseling and therapy to people with all levels of psychological difficulties and undergo the same licensing exam. They sometimes also conduct basic and applied research. By contrast, psychiatrists, who also may provide psychotherapy, are medical doctors licensed to prescribe drugs and otherwise treat physical causes of psychological disorders. Rather than seeking to change people to fit their environment, Community psychologists work to create social and physical environments that are healthy for all. To prevent bullying, they might consider ways to improve the culture of the school and neighborhood, and how to increase bystander intervention. With perspectives ranging from biological to social, and with settings ranging from the laboratory to the clinic to the office, psychology relates to many fields. Psychologists teach in medical schools, business schools, law schools, theological seminaries, and they work in hospitals, factories, and corporate offices. They engage in interdisciplinary studies such as 
Psychobiography, the study of lives and personalities of public figures. Psycholinguistics, the study of language and thinking. And psychoceramics, the study of crackpots. Psychology also influences culture. Knowledge transforms us. Learning about the solar system and germ theory of disease alter the way people think and act. Learning about psychology's findings also changes people. They less often judge psychological disorders as moral failings, treatable by punishment and ostracization. They less often regard and treat women as men's mental inferiors. They less often view and raise children as ignorant, willful beasts in need of taming. In each case noted, Morton Hunt, knowledge has modified attitudes and through them behavior. Once aware of psychology's well-researched ideas about how body and mind connect, how child's mind grows, how we construct our perceptions, how we learn and remember how people across the world are alike and different, your mind may never again be the same. But bear in mind psychology's limits. Don't expect it to answer the ultimate questions, such as those posed by Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy. Why should I live? Why should I do anything? Is there, any, is there in life any purpose which, is, which the inevitable death that awaits me does not undo and destroy? Although many of life's significant questions are beyond psychology, some important ones are illuminated by even a first psychology course. Through painstaking research, psychologists have gained insight into the brain and mind, dreams and memories, depression and joy. Even the unanswered questions can renew our sense of mystery about things we do not yet understand. Moreover, your study of psychology can help you, help teach you how to ask and answer important questions, how to think critically as you evaluate competing ideas and claims. Psychology deepens our appreciation for how we humans perceive, think, and feel and act. By doing so, it can enrich our lives and enlarge our vision. Through this book, we hope to help guide you toward that end. As educator Charlie Elliott said a century ago, books are the quietest and most consistent of friends and the most patient of teachers. Use psychology to become a stronger person and a better student. Psychology is not just about understanding others, but it's also about understanding ourselves. It's only through such learning that we can be and show the world our best selves. Through this text, we will offer evidence-based suggestions that you can use to live a happy, effective, and flourishing life, including the following. Managing your time to get a full night's sleep. Unlike sleep-deprived people who live with fatigue and gloomy moods, well-rested people live with greater energy, happiness, and productivity. Make space for exercise. Aerobic activity not only increases health and energy, it is also effective remedy for mild to moderate depression and anxiety. Set long-term goals with daily aims. Successful people take aim each day toward, to work toward their goals, such as exercising or sleeping more or eating more healthily. Over time, they often find that their daily practice becomes a habit. Have a growth mindset rather than seeing their abilities as fixed. Successful people view their abilities as like a muscle, something that grows stronger with effortful use. Prioritize relationships. We humans are social animals. We flourish, flourish when connected in close relationships. We are both happier and healthier when supported by and when supporting caring friends. Psychology's research also shows how we can learn and retain information. Many students assume that the way to cement new learning is to reread. What helps more, and what this book therefore encourages, is repeated self-testing and rehearsal of previously studied materials. Memory researchers Henry Rodiger and Jeffrey Karapik call this phenomenon the testing effect. It's sometimes called the retrieval practice effect or test-enhanced test learning. They note that a test is a powerful means of improving learning, not just assessing it. In one study, English-speaking students who had been tested repeatedly recalled the meaning of 20 previously learned Lithuanian words better than those who had spent the same amount of time re-studying those words. Repetitive testing reward, rewards also make it reinforcing. Students who used repetitive testing once found it helpful and more often used it later when learning new materials. Many other studies, including in college classrooms, confirm that frequent quizzing and self-testing boosts students' retention. As you will see in chapter eight, to master information, you must actively process it. In one digest of 225 studies, students engaged in active learning showed the highest examination performance in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM fields. Likewise, when learning a new language, 
Those who practiced speaking it learned it better than those who passively listened to it. Better to talk than to listen. So don't treat your mind like a stomach, something you, that will be filled passively. Treat it more like a muscle that can grow stronger with exercise. Countless experiments reveal that people learn and remember best when they put material in their own words, rehearse it, and then retrieve it again and review it again. The SQR3 study method incorporates these principles. SQ3R is an acronym for the five steps, survey, question, read, retrieve, and review. To study a chapter, first survey. Take a bird's eye view, scan the table of contents on the chapter's first pa page, and notice the organization. Before you read each main section, try to uh, answer its numbered learning objective questions. For this section, how can psychological principles help you learn, remember, and thrive? Researchers Rodiger and Brigid Finn have found that trying and failing to retrieve the answer is actually helpful in learning. Those who test their knowledge, their understanding before reading and discover what they don't yet know will learn and remember better. Then read, actively searching for the answer to the learning objectives question. At each sitting, read only as much of the chapter, usually a single main section, as you can absorb without tiring. Read actively and critically, ask questions, take notes, make the ideas your own. How does what you've read relate to your own life? Does it support or challenge your assumptions? How convincing is the evidence? Our new ask yourself questions and apply psychological science features throughout each chapter will help you engage personally with the material. Write out what you know. Writing is often a tool for learning, says researchers. Having read a section, retrieve its main ideas. Actively retrieve, active retrieval promotes meaningful learning, says Karpik. So test yourself. This will not only help you figure out what you know, the testing itself will help you learn and retain information more effectively. Even better, test yourself repeatedly. To facilitate this, we offer periodic retrieval practice questions throughout each chapter. For example, the questions at the end of this section. After answering these questions for yourself, you can check back and answer in Appendix E and reread the material as needed. Finally, review. Read over any notes you've taken Again, with an eye on the chapter's organization and quickly review the whole chapter. Write or say what the concept is before rereading to check your understanding. Survey, question, read, retrieve, and review. We have, an organi we have organized this book's chapters to facilitate your use of the SQ3R study system. Each chapter begins with an outline that aids your survey. Headings and learning objective questions suggest issues and concepts you should consider as you read. The material is organized into sections of readable length. The retrieval practice question you will challenge you to retrieve what you have learned and thus retain it better. The end of section review is set up as a self-test with the collected learning objective question and key terms listed, along with the master of material questions in a variety of formats. In the ebook, answer checking is a click away. In the printed text, answers may be found in Appendix C and in Appendix D. Survey questions, survey, question, read. Four additional study tips may further boost your learning. Distribute your study time. One of psychology's oldest findings is that spaced practice promotes better retention than mass practice. You'll remember material better if you space your time over several study periods, perhaps one hour a day, six days a week, rather than cramming it into one week-long or all-night study blitz. For example, rather than trying to read the entire chapter in a single sitting, read just one main section and then turn to something else. Interleaving your study of psychology with your study of, of other subjects boosts long-term retention and protect, protects against overconfidence. Spacing your study sections requires a disciplined approach to managing your time. For more tips on time management, see the new student preface, student success, how to apply psychology to your life to live your best life at the beginning of this text. Learn to think critically. Both inside and outside of this course, critical thinking, smart thinking is key to wisdom. Whether you're reading or conversing, note people's assumptions and values. What perspectives or bias underlie an argument? Evaluate evidence. Is it, an is it anecdotal or is it based on information? Informative experiments. Assess conclusions. Are there alternative explanations? 
Process class information actively. Listen for the main idea and the sub-ideas of a lecture. Write them down. Ask questions during and after class. In class, as you're, as in your private study, process the information actively and you will understand and retain it better. As psychologist William James urged a century ago, no reception without reaction, no impression without expression. Make the information your own. Engage with the ask yourself questions and the apply psychological science features found periodically throughout each chapter to relate what you've read to your own life. Tell someone else about it. As any teacher will confirm, to teach is to remember. Also, take notes by hand. Handwritten notes in your own words typically engage more active processing with better retention than does verbatim note taking on laptops. Overlearn. Psychology tells us that overlearning improves retention. We are prone to overestimate how much we know. You may understand a chapter as you read it, but that feeling of familiarity can be deceptively comforting. By using the retrieval practice and the master of the material questions, as well as our online learning opportunities, you can test your knowledge and overlearn in the process. Memory expert Elizabeth Bjork and Robert Bjork offer simple science-supported advice for how to improve your retention and your grades. Spend less time on the input side and more time on the output side, such as summarizing what you have read from memory or getting together with friends and asking each other questions. Any activity that involves testing yourself, that is, activities that require you to retrieve or generate information rather than just representing information to yourself will make your learning both more durable and flexible.